to Cinema Wellman. I am your host, David, and I'm excited about today's episode because I get to talk about this year's Best Picture nominees. I'm pleased to say that I liked every one of this year's 10 nominees at some level or another, and that doesn't always happen. In fact, since the Academy Awards made the grave mistake of doubling the number of Best Picture nominees back in 2009, there have been only three, now four years, that I liked all 10 nominees. I love the fact that the last year there were only five Best Picture nominees, the way it should be. Uh, That was the year that I saw all five in a theater in the same day in one sitting. I hated a couple of those movies, but that day remains one of my most cherished movie memories. So here are this year's Best Picture nominees ranked by how much I like them and nothing more. I am not a film critic by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, to quote an old friend of mine, these are just like my opinions, man. So we're going to start with number 10, and it's Maestro, directed by Bradley Cooper, and it received seven Oscar nominations. IMDb tells us, this love story chronicles the lifelong relationship of conductor-composer Leonard Bernstein and actress Felicia Montalagra Cohen Bernstein. Biopics are kind of tricky in my mind. If you're familiar with the person before the movie comes out, you most likely have an opinion about them and their real life. If uh, I, I think you not only need to like the subject, but also like the person playing the subject. I was never a big fan of Leonard Bernstein. He was great, but not a fan. I'm not a big fan of Bradley Cooper either. Uh, if I was, I'm sure I would have enjoyed this film much more. Maestro was very well done. Cooper does a solid job in front of and behind the camera. And the music was lovely. I found his voice to be grating after a while, but that's what Bernstein sounded like, so no problem. While discussing this film with my sister Vanessa, she mentioned that she was distracted by the amount of smoking in the film, and I agreed with her. I realized that they both smoked, and, and this is a biopic, but it was a lot. I think the only time he isn't smoking is when he's conducting. But once again, true to real life, as was The Nose. I have zero issue with The Nose, and was kind of shocked that some people did. Look at a picture of Leonard Bernstein. He did not have a small nose. Neither does Bradley Cooper, for that matter. Cooper, there's not much makeup on top of that nose to make it look like Leonard Bernstein. So get over it and find something else to complain about. Maestro finishes at number 10 because when you have a list of 10 items, one of them has to be number 10, even if it's good. Number 9, directed by Alexander Payne, we have The Holdovers that earned a total of five Oscar nominations. IMDb, a cranky history teacher at a remote prep school is forced to remain on campus over the holidays with a troubled student who has no place to go and a grieving cook. I love Paul Giamatti. I love his unique look the sound of his voice, and his delivery. He's also very good at playing grumpy, cranky, which he gets to quite a bit in The Holdovers. Being a former teacher, I enjoyed Giamatti's portrayal of a teacher who has just about had enough. Been there, done that. When I was teaching, I always knew that troubled students were troubled for a reason. I tried to find out what was going on while others were dismissing them as a problem student. There was always a reason behind that trouble, and in most cases, it wasn't the student's fault at all. No student should be dismissed, except from class. One of the aspects of this film I enjoyed is the fact that it is a, I don't know how to, it's a real movie, in the sense that no sets or sound stages were used. And director Alexander Payne wanted certain scenes to be shot in the snow, so they waited for it to snow. That always makes the film more natural to me, things like that, although I realize this realism doesn't lend itself to certain genres. Detractors have said that this film is sappy and schmaltzy, but it takes place at a boarding school. A lot of films set in boarding schools are sappy and schmaltzy. Not Taps, though. Or or The Tribe. Um, Next, at number eight, is Anatomy of a Fall, directed by Justine Triette and earned five Oscar nominations. IMDb says, A woman is suspected of murder after her husband's death, and their visually challenged son faces a moral dilemma as the main witness. This taut French thriller will have you wondering and questioning throughout. 
since we don't see the man's death, we don't know if the woman killed her husband or not. I don't think I'm the only person who saw this that kept going back and forth. I'd say, no, she didn't do it. I would say, oh my, oh my, she did do it. I love movies that keep me guessing. I also love movies that I can't totally figure out after 20 minutes. I'm looking at you, The Sixth Sense. It took the filmmakers seven months to find the young man who plays the son, and he's one of the best parts of this film. The accused woman is played by Sandra Huller, who earned a Best Actress nomination for her performance. She's excellent. I'm going to talk about her in this episode, but not right now. After reading about the film, I know I'm not the only one in the dark about the woman's guilt or innocence while watching it. Director Justine Triet didn't even tell Huller whether her character committed the murder or not. Triette's only instructions were, play it like you're innocent. Most excellent. At number seven is directed by Celine Long, Song, I'm sorry, and it's Past Lives, earning two Oscar nominations. IMDb says, Nora and Hei Sung, two deeply connected childhood friends, are rested apart after Nora's family leaves South Korea. 20 years later, they are reunited for one fateful week as they confront notions of love and destiny. First of all, kudos to director Celine Song. This is her directorial, directorial? <laughs> you know what I meant, as a uh, debut, and she garners a Best Picture nomination. Well done. Past Lives is a story about many things, with love at the forefront right alongside unrequited love. And unrequited love flat out sucks. I've always said that movies have magical powers over us that include the ability to dredge up memories you haven't had for years and years. Even though Past Lives is about childhood friends who are separated and then reunited two decades later, it made me think of a young woman I met briefly when I was 16. Vanessa was a freshman at SUNY Binghamton, and my parents and I visited her, most likely on parents' weekend. In a bold move, my parents allowed me to stay at the dorm as opposed to the hotel with them. I hung out with a group of guys that weekend who were very accommodating to a high school junior, and I also hung out with Maureen. She was my type before I knew what my type was, and we spent many hours together, just the two of us, just talking and getting to know each other. Maureen had a boyfriend who she told me about, and nothing happened between us except for a connection that I felt. When I got home after that weekend, I remember crying myself to sleep that Sunday night because I knew I'd probably never see her again. Past lives brought me right back to that moment, and I felt those same feelings all over again, watching the characters navigate a relationship they felt differently about. That's magic. Director Song made a brilliant choice by not having the adult actors playing the couple meet before the shoot. She also didn't want them hanging around with each other off screen so their interactions on screen would be fresh. This totally worked and added to the overall realistic feel of the film. So another romantic drama that I liked and would recommend, what has become of me? At number six, directed by Cord Jefferson, American Fiction. IMDb says, a novelist who's fed up with the establishment profiting from black entertainment uses a pen name to write a book that propels him into the heart of the hypocrisy and madness he claims to disdain. I've always enjoyed movies about writers, whether they be journalists or poets or novelists. It could be because I was an English teacher for 33 years. I find it very interesting to see them work their craft, and I always wondered what it would be like to be a great writer. I may also enjoy these types of films because I have more than a few friends who are writers. And I, and I don't mean bloggers, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, real writers, journalists, poets, etc. I may even know a Pulitzer Prize winner. So there are several reasons I found American fiction compelling, well done, and a movie I heartily recommend. I'm not giving away anything that's not in the trailer, but the author's family suffers a loss that hit me very hard because of who it was. I spent much of the rest of the movie thinking about how that loss would affect me if it happened in my life. Another example of movies working their magic. I never said all the magic was positive. Both Jeffrey Wright and Sterling K. Brown were nominated for their performance and both were brilliant. 
Jeffrey Wright is an excellent actor who may get the recognition he deserves when the Oscars are handed out next month. And another first-time director with a Best Picture nomination. Well done, Cord Jefferson. Looking forward to future work. At number five, directed by Martin Scorsese, is Killers of the Flower Moon that earned 10 Oscar nominations. IMDb says, When oil is discovered in 1920s Oklahoma under Osage Nation land, the Osage people are murdered one by one until the FBI steps in to unravel the mystery. Legendary director Martin Scorsese's 26th feature film is an epic story of organized, choreographed, and pretty much legalized murder of somewhere between 20 and 24 members of the Osage Nation. I often mention how much I appreciate authenticity and realism in films, so I was pleased to read that Scorsese lobbied for and received approval of the Osage Nation in the making of this film. Osage Nation representatives work closely with Scorsese to ensure authenticity and accuracy in the telling of this important story. This investigation was the first ever assigned to the newly formed FBI and its evil and corrupt head troll. Lily Gladstone becomes the first Native American to be nominated for her excellent performance, a well-deserved nomination, and let's keep breaking those barriers. I love the way Martin Scorsese describes this film. He said, it's, it's not a who done it, it's a who didn't do it. This film is a long and bleak journey, but well worth it. At number four, directed by Greta Gerwig, is Barbie. And Barbie earned eight Oscar nominations. IMDb says Barbie and Ken are having the time of their lives in the colorful and seemingly perfect world of Barbie land. However, when they get a chance to go to the real world, they soon discover the joys and perils of living among humans. I already talked at length about Barbie because the film was featured as the best film screened here at Cinema Wellman last September. I raved about it and said I thought it would be nominated for Oscars, and here we are. How about that? I don't want to be redundant, but I wanted to touch upon a few items before moving on to the second half of last summer's unlikely double feature. Okay, Barbie is 23% larger than her surroundings in the film, the exact proportions of the real Barbie in her world. Margot Robbie insisted that every member of the cast and crew wear something pink to work every day of the shoot. Almost all practical effects were used, all sets were hand-painted, and all designs were taken from original Barbie stuff. Like I said, authenticity. The song, I'm Just Ken, was written as a joke. Director Greta Gerwig loved it and included it in the film, and now it's nominated for a Best Original Song Oscar. Go figure. Paddle hands were tested, but only Kate McKinnon could pull it off convincingly, so the idea was scrapped. And I'm so pleased to see that America Ferrera was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Her Feminista Manifesta monologue was amazing and deserves to be heard by everyone. I loved Barbie, but I'm afraid of what it may have spawned. I read that after the film's success, Mattel began developing 45 more film projects. Now, there's no way they all get made, but they're thinking of 45 movies based on toys and games. Are you ready for films about American Girl Dolls, Hot Wheels, Magic 8-Ball, Matchbox Cars, Polly Pocket, Uno, Rock'em Sock'em Robots? Be honest, a couple of those sounded pretty interesting to you. (laughs) On to the Heimer part of Barbie Heimer. It's about a different type of toy. Was that a tagline for that? That's not bad. It's not bad. We have Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan, and it received 13 Oscar nominations. IMDb says it's the story of American scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer and his role in the development of the atomic bomb. I love Christopher Nolan films, especially the ones I can understand, and I understood Oppenheimer. This multi-layered World War II epic is just about everything you could want in an exciting suspense thriller, and this thriller is true. Nolan expertly switches between color and black and white depending on which of two characters' perspectives is being shown at the time. He also realized how important production design was to this film, so he cut 
shoot it, he cut the shooting schedule by 30 days to free up money that was then spent on production design. And this attention to detail speaks volumes of Nolan, as does his giving up 30 days of shooting to benefit the film in another area. The cast is filled with big name known stars. Nolan did this on purpose to help the audience keep the characters apart by having them portrayed by familiar faces. You can do that when all of these known stars take massive pay cuts just to work with Nolan. It says a lot about him as a director, again. Killian Murphy is hauntingly phenomenal as Oppenheimer, and he may win Best Oscar, Best Actor Oscar uh, laurels next month as well. Now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. This is an amazing film. I expect it to win Best Picture when that award is handed out at the end of the sixth hour of next month's telecast. Number two on the list is directed by Jonathan Glazer and earned five Oscar nominations, and it is The Zone of Interest. IMDb says, Auschwitz Commandant Rudolf Haas and his wife Hedwig strive to build a dream life for their family in a house and garden beside the camp. When I first read the premise of this film, I was thinking it was going to be very difficult to watch. I figured the director was going to show us the opulence of the rich Nazis juxtaposed with the suffering of the prisoners. Then I thought Spielberg already did that with the scene at the train station in Schindler's List in a sequence that still haunts me. So instead of repeating something previously done, director Jonathan Glazer doesn't show the camp or the prisoners once. We can hear the screams and the gunshots. We can see the smokestacks belching fire and smoke on the other side of the wall, but we never see the other side of the wall. I thought that was a brilliant plan by Glazer. We don't need to see the prisoners or the suffering because we've seen it before. We know what's going on on the other side of that wall. What Glazer chooses to show us instead is how life goes on normally on the Nazi side of that very same wall, and that is as disturbing and frightening in its own way as seeing the prisoners would have been. Glazer shot this film in a unique way in the sense that cameras were placed throughout the sets without operators, the same with microphones. Up to 10 cameras and 30 mics were in play at any given time, and the actors didn't even know if they were being shot in a close-up or a long shot, which I found fascinating. I saw the zone of interest at the AMC, not a sponsor, and watched Anatomy of a Fall when I got home. As I was watching the French thriller with the lead actress speaking French and English quite fluently, I had to suddenly pause the film and head to IMDb. Is, the, is that actress the same woman who I just saw play the commandant's wife in the zone of interest? The actress who spoke fluent German in that film? Yes, yes it was. That may be best actress right there. Two phenomenal performances in three languages. Sandra Huller, you are amazing, and I will now look for everything else you've ever done. My AMC audience for this screening was a total of two. I was kind of glad that was the case after I audibly gasped at one of Huller's lines. I may have even uttered an expletive of sorts. I used to teach World War II in the Holocaust, so I recognized the name Rudolf Haas as the Auschwitz Commandant. His name stood out because he was found guilty at the Nuremberg trials and executed. In a case of epic karma, Haas was brought back to Auschwitz to be hanged. He is said to be the last person to die there. Now, I'm not spoiling anything about the movie because it doesn't even come close to telling that part of the story. That part of the story actually isn't important, if you can imagine that. This is stunning work by everyone involved, and I will see it again. I may start buying DVDs again. They still exist, right? So that leaves number one on Cinema Wellman's Best Picture Rundown Rankings, and it's a film directed by friend of Cinema Wellman, Yorgos Lanthimos, and it is Poor Things, and it earned 11 Oscar nominations. IMDb says, The incredible tale about the fantastical evolution of Bella Baxter, a young woman brought back to life by the brilliant and unorthodox scientist Dr. Godwin Baxter. Even though Poor Things finished in the top spot of this year's nominees and earned 11 Oscar nominations, I'm not going to say much about it at all. 
It was absolutely amazing. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but it was magical. I loved this movie. Emma Stone's portrayal of Bella Baxter may very well earn her a Best Actress Oscar. And if that happens, it will be well deserved. He wasn't nominated, but I loved Willem Dafoe as the unorthodox doctor. Poor Things needs to be seen to be believed and needs to be seen more than once, actually. More DVDs. It is an otherworldly experience that director Lanthimos prefaces by the statement, and I quote, if you start to analyze the film as something that would actually happen, then, of course, the film doesn't work. When you, you immerse yourself in his poor things world, I love those animals, you will see that this film works on all levels. Well, that is a wrap from here at Cinema Wellman for our best picture rundown. We looked at all 10 and we gave you our official ranking as it stands for now. In three weeks, we'll be doing our annual Cinema Wellman Oscar ballot and we hope you'll be back for that. But next week, we'll be showcasing simians. All monkeys, all the time. And until then, take care.